whether the bell mic is on or not. I'd like to add my welcome to Mitch's this morning, especially to the visitors we have with us today, and expand a little bit on what Mitch had to say earlier as a way of explanation to our visitors. We are between full-time preachers right at the moment. We are still a few weeks away from Tyler Sam's starting. And in the interim, we've been relying upon the men of the congregation to bring us lessons on Sunday. And the content of those lessons has been uniformly excellent. There perhaps have been some rough edges in delivery, as there will be rough edges in the delivery this morning. And I would appeal to the visitors, especially any visitors we have from the community, that you not judge us on the basis of the rough edges, but that you come back once Tyler has begun his work here and give us another opportunity when you hear a real preacher instead of one of our uh, substitutes we've got here. If you have a Bible and wish to follow along with the reading this morning, please open to Acts, the 12th chapter. In Acts, we have the account of Herod's execution of James the Apostle, of his arrest and imprisonment of Peter, and of Peter's subsequent delivery by the hand of an angel of the Lord. And I really want to pick up the reading after that in verse 11 and read down through verse 17 of Acts 12. <clears throat> When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. I read this somewhat lengthy, lengthy account here in order to introduce the subject of the lesson this morning, John, who was called Mark. I have a fondness for many of the minor and less well-known characters in the Bible. The major characters are major for a reason. The number of lessons you can derive from the lives of Abraham and Moses, of David, of Peter, it just seemed to be endless. But it's amazing the lessons you can get from those who are almost just mentioned in passing in Scripture. Not too many months ago, we had a lesson from Brother Evans on Abigail. Who would have thought you could get a lesson out of Abigail, the few verses that she has mentioned? And of course, we're all familiar with lessons regarding Nadab and Abihu and things not to do, the way we do not live our life. Have you ever had a lesson on faith? based on Caleb, and some of you are scratching your head saying, who was Caleb? Caleb is not mentioned very much either, but there are a number of lessons to be derived from the account of Caleb in the Old Testament there. And then there is John Mark here in the New Testament. Uh, John Mark is mentioned in something like 10 verses, and 10 verses only here in the New Testament. But there are some lessons we can derive from the things he did in those 10 verses. We've already read the first mention of John, who was called Mark. I may call him John, I may call him Mark, I may call him John Mark as we go along. There in Acts 12, 12, I may come back to that verse in just a moment. The next mention of John Mark is still in, the Acts, in Acts the 12th chapter, but down to verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Barnabas and Paul had come to Jerusalem at the end of chapter 11, and they may very well have been in Jerusalem during the time that James was executed and Peter was imprisoned. 
But now they have finished their mission in Jerusalem. They are returning to Antioch, which was sort of their home congregation at this time. And they took John Mark with them. Not too surprising, a young man needed some experience at the gospel. Who better to travel with than Paul and Barnabas? Besides, Barnabas was his cousin. Colossians 4.10 mentions that. So he's going with a relative. I don't know whether John prompted this or, or Barnabas did, but John Mark is traveling with Paul and Barnabas as they go back to Antioch. Now, Paul and Barnabas were probably not in Antioch very long before they left on what we call Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, and John Mark went with them as helper in the 13th chapter of Acts, beginning at verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. So John traveled with Paul and Barnabas as they left on this first missionary journey. They started the work in Cyprus, which is a good place to start out. Very convenient. It was close. But more importantly, I think, Barnabas was from Cyprus. So Barnabas likely had family, friends, and acquaintances scattered throughout Cyprus. The gospel had been preached in Cyprus before. It is said that some of those who left Jerusalem after the death of Stephen during the persecutions by Saul went to Cyprus preaching the gospel. And the mention of synagogues, plural, of Jews, lets us know that there was a fairly decent Jewish population on the island of Cyprus. Now this is a very easy way to start, and this is very good if you're missionaries, having all of these things waiting for you there in Cyprus. In those days, holiday inns and marriotts were few and far between. There were not a lot of places to stay. Oh, there were inns of one kind or another. For the most part, if you were a serious traveler concerned about your health and well-being, you didn't want to stay in any of those inns. They were not the greatest places to stay. Uh, they were insect-ridden. Uh, the owners made money in part by cramming as many people as possible into a room. And a lot of times they made most of their money from alcohol and sex rather than providing a place for people to stay. So it would not have been the most pleasant of surroundings to stay in, in public accommodations like that. No, most travelers there in the first century, to the extent that they could, relied upon the hospitality of others for a place to stay. And in this case, again, we've got Barnabas's family and acquaintances, perhaps scattered throughout Cyprus. We have Christians, perhaps scattered throughout Cyprus. We have Jews scattered throughout Cyprus. All of these could be relied upon, to one degree or another, to provide accommodations for missionaries who were traveling. It's, this is important not only in terms of having a place to stay, but of having the proper kind of food to eat. You really get the feeling sometimes in reading through the Bible that of all the things in the law, the Jews were more concerned about what and how they ate than just about anything else. If you remember last week, one of Tyler's sermons that he brought to us, he was talking about the days of King Saul and one particular battle that he was involved in and he had made his soldiers take an oath not to eat until they had won the battle which of course left his soldiers very hungry, so that when they came across some livestock that they could eat, they just immediately there on the spot slaughtered them and ate them with the blood. They did not bleed them properly in accordance with the dictates of the law. Now, King Saul was not the most stringent follower of the law that we've got in the Old Testament. In fact, the law was a convenience for him. When it, suited his fancies, he followed the law. When it didn't, he made up his own rules, it seems. But on this particular occasion, when he heard that the people were eating meat that had been improperly prepared, he was appalled. So even that got to him, and he took steps to prepare better food for them to eat. 
running forward in time to the time of Daniel, what was it that set Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego apart from the other Jews that had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar? They refused to eat from the king's table, probably because they were concerned about whether the food would have been properly prepared in accordance with the law. Running it forward still farther to the time of Peter, after Peter had preached to Cornelius and had converted him to Christ, when Peter returned to Jerusalem, he was confronted by the Jews, some of whom, the conservative Jewish Christians, were very critical of what Peter had done on that occasion. Were they critical of the fact that Peter had baptized a Gentile? No. Were they critical of the fact that Peter had preached to a Gentile? No. They were critical of the fact that Peter had eaten in a Gentile's house. You can preach to them and baptize them, but whatever you do, don't eat with them. Eating was very important to the Jews there of the first century. In fact, throughout their entire lineage from the time the law was given. And so it was very important for people like Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, as they traveled in this region, to be able to count on having food prepared in accordance with the law. Anytime they stayed with the relatives of Barnabas or with other Jews, they certainly could count on that. And the other Christians in Cyprus, at this time, the, the gospel had not gone to Gentiles very much. So probably most of those Christians were Jews as well. And don't ever get the idea that as soon as Jews were converted to Christ, they immediately stepped away from the law. Weaning the Jews from the law was a process, it was not an event. Many, many years after this time, you have James in Jerusalem saying that there were many Jews that had been converted to Christ and they were all zealous for the law. It took a long time for the Jews to get over the requirements of the law. And so it was still important to a great many of the Jews that the instructions in the law in regard to what they ate and how it was prepared continued to be followed. So in any event, this makes the trip to Cyprus a very convenient way to start out a missionary journey, a very easy way to start out a missionary journey. Not that it was all a bed of roses. It had to have been unsettling to John Mark the way that trip to Cyprus appears to have ended up in the palace of the governor, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul of Cyprus, the Roman governor of Cyprus, the highest Roman official on the island. They ended up preaching to him. That would have been a new experience for John Mark in particular, and something that had to have been uncomfortable for him. But it's a way to get his feet wet and get him immersed in the process of what they were going to be going through. Shortly after that, they left Cyprus. They went on to Asia Minor, north out of Cyprus, specifically to Perga in Pamphylia. Acts 13, the 13th, chap thir 13th chapter, the 13th verse. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos, which was on Cyprus, and came to Perga in Pamphylia, but John left them there and returned to Jerusalem. Luke's account here is very noncommittal and would seem innocent enough. They've gotten to a new port, and John decided to go home. He just left them there. But there's more to the story that we're not told right at this location. By the end of Acts, the 14th chapter, Paul and Barnabas had finished this first missionary journey, and they had returned to Antioch. And sometime after their return, problems arose there in the church in Antioch when they had some Judaizing teachers come in, teaching that it was necessary for Gentiles to be converted to Judaism before they could be converted to Christ and accept the blessings available under Christ. Paul and Barnabas and others were sent to Jerusalem to deal with this problem, to discuss it with the apostles and elders there and see if they had indeed commissioned that particular teaching. They had not. And the apostles and elders repudiated the Judaizing teachers and acknowledged the right of Gentiles to receive the gospel without becoming Jews first. That taken care of, Paul and Barnabas prepared to leave 
for another missionary journey. In Acts, the 15th chapter, verse 36 in particular, and after some days, Paul and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Paul's behavior here suggests that Mark's leaving in Perga was anything but innocent. Paul's reaction may prefigure what he said about another helper later on, a fellow named Demas. In 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul said, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. That same word that he applied to John Mark here. We don't know with any certainty what John Mark's problem was and why he left Paul and Barnabas there in Perga. Commentators like to speculate, and I'm going to do that a little bit this morning as well. We're not told with certainty, but there's a few things we can determine about John. He seems to have been young, from what little we know. And this first missionary journey, his first journey with Paul and Barnabas, may have begun with the enthusiasm of youth as a great adventure. The reality was likely far less romantic. It was hard work. There was uncertainty. Then there was that time spent with the proconsul. That had to have been unnerving. So Mark arrived in Perga already perhaps somewhat disillusioned, beginning to question whether this was really something he wanted to do with his life. Mark seems to have been from what was a well-to-do family there in Jerusalem. Remember that first passage where we met Mark back in Acts 12. We found the church gathered in his mother's house there praying for Peter's deliverance. And the text says the house was large enough to accommodate many Christians. There was a courtyard. There was at least one servant. That's the house of somebody who was wealthy. That was not the house the normal lower class person lived in. So Mark may very well have grown up in a wealthy household, always having a soft bed to sleep on, never having missed a meal, and all those meals for sure being prepared in accordance with the law. Thirdly, Mark was a Jerusalem Jew. And that carries a lot of weight. The most conservative bastion of Judaism in the New Testament world was Jerusalem. That's where your most conservative Jews were. There were Gentiles in Jerusalem by this time under the Roman rule. But depending on where you lived and what you did during the course of the day, you might go days without encountering a Gentile. And now in Perga of Pamphylia, it's a Gentile world. Jews there are the exception. Understand the animosity that existed between Jews and Gentiles. Jewish children were raised from birth being told not to associate with Gentiles. You could, as a Jew, could be walking down the street, and if you saw a Gentile coming towards you, you would cross the street. So you would not have to be on the same side of the street with them. Remember Peter getting in trouble for eating with a Gentile. And Gentiles didn't like Jews either, many of them anyway. So he's now in an area where it doesn't matter which side of the street he's going to be on. He's going to be encountering Gentiles. And Gentiles who might not look on him very nicely, him being a Jew. So Mark stood there in Perga, and he looked ahead, and he saw hardship. He saw uncertainty. He saw the discomfort of being in a totally unfamiliar world than the one he had been raised in. 
He would be surrounded by Gentiles, something he had been taught all of his life to avoid. Now he can't get away from them. He doesn't know where he's going to be sleeping every night. He might end up camping out by the side of the road. He might end up staying in the home of a Gentile. He doesn't know what he's going to eat. He doesn't know if he's going to eat. Paul missed meals regularly. He mentions that in Philippians 4. And when he does eat, what kind of food is he going to be eating? Is it going to be prepared in accordance with the law? He doesn't know. Paul, by this point, and even Barnabas, may not have cared that much. They may have gotten to the point where those food restrictions didn't bother them quite as much. But I'm sure they bothered Mark. He was new to this sort of thing. And I have to believe that Paul would have been a very tra challenging travel companion. The intensity of Paul and his dedication to the work had to be a challenge to a youth traveling with them. On the other hand, he could look back at the home he had left and see a soft bed with linen sheets, regular meals, every one of them prepared in accordance with the law, and not having to deal with Gentiles. So Mark stood there in Perga, and he looked ahead, and he looked back, and he turned back. It would not go any farther with Paul and Barnabas. The adventure was over. Paul called him a deserter. Paul at this juncture may have been thinking of some of Christ's words as recorded there in Luke, read in our reading this morning. Again, Luke 9 and particularly verse 62. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. My dad had an experience once that really drove Christ's warning here home to him, made it come alive and very meaningful. My dad was born on a farm. He was raised as a farmer. When he was about 19 or 20, in the late 1930s, he had the opportunity to participate in a plowing contest. Uh, don't think horses, think tractors here. We were that far advanced at that point. Driving a tractor, pulling a plow. And those contestants in that contest were going to be judged on how straight their furrows were. Dad was a good driver of a tractor. He knew how to plow a straight line. And he says on that day, he was hot. He knew that no one living had ever plowed a straighter furrow than what he was plowing that day. He was so pleased with what he was doing that before he got to the end of the row, he turned around and looked behind him to see how straight his furrows were. I don't know how many of you have driven a tractor pulling a plow. I haven't. But I have driven a car and I have ridden a bicycle. And I think I've caught just about everybody but the smallest children here. You've all driven a car or ridden a bicycle. And I will ask you, what happens if you're riding along, driving along, and you turn around and look back over your shoulder? You're going to go off to one side or the other. It's inevitable. Same thing happened to my dad. He realized it immediately, and he straightened up the tractor and went on and finished his row. But he put just a little bit of a kink in his furrow there. One of the judges told him later on that that cost him the contest. He would have won if it had not been for looking back over his shoulder that one time and putting that little bit of a kink in his furrow. The point of that being, whether you are plowing or driving a car or riding a bicycle, if you're looking behind you, there's a real good chance that you're not going to end up where you think you're going. You're going to end up somewhere else. If you want to get somewhere, especially by the straightest route possible, 
You've got to have your attention centered on the goal, where you're trying to get to, not on what's behind you. And what is true in the world of plowing, driving, and riding a bicycle is just as true in our service to God. In Philippians, the third chapter, beginning with the 13th verse, Paul wrote there, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Also in Colossians, the third chapter, the first couple of verses. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Somewhere along the way, Mark had lost sight of the goal. He was more concerned with the comforts of here and now, with the things he had left behind in Jerusalem. He was no longer centered on where he was going, what he was supposed to be trying to accomplish. He had put his hand to the plow, he had looked back, and he had turned back. In Paul's words, he was a deserter. In Christ's words, he was not fit for the kingdom. There's an object lesson here about fighting the good fight and finishing the course and maintaining one's sense of direction as a Christian. And what can happen to you if you don't keep your mind centered on where you're going? We have to keep centered on our goal. We have to keep moving forward toward it. Looking back on the things we've left behind, and all of us as converts to Christ have left something behind. We cannot continue to look back on it, perhaps with longing, perhaps with regret, and expect to reach the goal that Christ has set for us. We just won't get there if we spend all of our time looking behind us. Not very many verses in a young man's life, but a very profound lesson to be learned there that all of us need to take to heart and keep in mind about knowing what our goal is and keeping centered on it and not looking back. But that's not the only lesson we can learn from John Mark because the story does not end there. Remember that split between Paul and Barnabas back in Acts, the 15th chapter, when they had separated? I didn't read the entire verse there, verse 39. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. So when Paul and Barnabas separated on that occasion, Barnabas took Mark with him again. Mark apparently wanted to try again. It may have sunk into him just what he had done. He may have been aware of what Paul was saying about him. And he wanted a chance to start over, to prove himself again. There are a couple of things we can get out of this. One, no matter how far down a Christian falls, and many Christians will fall, he or she can always get up and start over again and recommit to God and refocus, recenter on the goal that's ahead, Mark evidently wanted to do that. And we also have to be willing to give the repentant Christian the chance to start over. In this case, Paul was wrong. Barnabas is the hero of this particular account. Too often we may be tempted to give up on someone who has fallen away and come back, especially if they've done the, sa the same thing over and over again. I've seen that happen to some Christians. We may be tempted to give up on them. But sometimes what they need is a Barnabas. Barnabas. 
to encourage them, to give them another start, to help them along their way toward the goal that Christ has set for us. Mark is mentioned four more times in Scripture. In Philemon, the verses 23 and 24. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers, written by Paul some years later, calling Mark one of his fellow workers. Mark was traveling with Paul at this point and was a fellow worker with Paul. And back in Colossians, again, I'd mentioned this verse er earlier, Colossians, the fourth chapter, verse 10, New Bible, the pages are sticking together. Colossians 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Paul no longer is looking on Mark as a deserter. He is somebody he's willing to, he's asking that he be, be welcomed. And another congregation there, the congregation at Colossae. Also, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 11, Paul in prison now. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Paul wanted Mark there with him now and recognized him as being useful to Paul in his service to the gospel. And not only was he useful to Paul, but he apparently was also useful to Peter. In 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, the 13th verse, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. So John Mark apparently was traveling with Peter as well at this point in Peter's life. And tradition tells us that Mark, at some time later, writing perhaps at Peter's dictation, penned the gospel account we know as Mark's gospel. Quite an accomplishment for a failure who had once deserted Christ. So what lessons do we learn from the life of John Mark? Where is your attention focused? Is it ahead toward the goal? Or have you let your attention slip backward toward the things of the world? Are you in danger of becoming a deserter or someone not fit for the kingdom? If having one put, once put your hand to Christ's plow, you feel that you have lost direction, Christ says you may not be fit for his kingdom, but it's never too late to redirect your attention and refocus on that true goal and recommit to reaching that goal. And unlike the unforgiving judges of my dad's plowing contest, once you get yourself back on the true path, God is not going to be paying any attention to the kinks you've put in your furrows. And those who have not so strayed would do well to remember the example of Barnabas. He needs to be our hero in this story in particular. So this morning, if you have not yet put on Christ by obeying his commands, you don't really have to worry about looking back. You're already all the way back. You can't get back any farther. You're not moving forward. If you want a place in his kingdom, you're going to have to put your hands to the plow. You're going to have to make that commitment and then follow the path to Christ's goal. And this may be the best chance you ever have to do so this morning. So if there are any here this morning that want to commit to Christ or to straighten out a plowed furrow that has perhaps gone astray, you have the opportunity to do something about it now. You'll come forward while we stand and sing.